Welcome, everyone. I think that we will begin. I am Amy Schuster. I am a member of the local chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace, and I am so honored to be here today with our guest speaker, um, Omar Bargudi, who I will inter introduce in a moment, and my, my co-moderator, Pranav Jani, who I also um, introduce in a moment. Um, I just wanted to let you all know this event is co-sponsored by a huge number of organizations that I really want to um, express my gratitude for. So just give me a moment. Um, we are not numbers. It's a writer's collective in Gaza. And I'll say a little bit more about them at the end of this, uh, this conversation. They are co-sponsoring this along with a slew of JVP chapters. So if you are from uh, these chapters, I'd love to, to, see, to hear you. Um, in the in the chat, let us know that you're here. JVP Albany, JVP Albuquerque, JVP Detroit, uh, JVP Bay Area, JVP Cleveland, JVP Los Angeles, JVP Milwaukee, JVP Northern New Jersey, JVP Sacramento, JVP San Diego, JVP Swarthmore, JVP Triangle, uh, North Carolina, JVP Tucson. JVP Westchester. Uh, we also are being co-sponsored by the Columbus Free Press, a local newspaper um, in our hometown, uh, the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, uh, Israel Committee Against House Demolitions, ICAD USA, and Middle East Peace Now. So thank you so much to our co-sponsors for, uh, for hosting this event. And uh, our our head, headline, our, our keynote um, conversationalist is um, Omar Bogudi. He was actually born in Qatar, uh, grew up in Egypt um, and then the US. Uh, he holds a master's um, in electrical engineering from Columbia University and another master's uh, in philosophy in Tel Aviv University. He lives in Accra um, and holds um, Israeli permanent residency. He's the co-founder of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement. And in 2017, Omar received the Gandhi Peace Award for his contributions made in the promotion of international peace and goodwill. So I am so excited to have him here with us today. And um, along with me is Pranav Jani, who is Associate Professor of English at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. He's currently serving um, in many roles, not only as father, um, but also he serves as the director of the Asian American Studies Program. He's a chapter president of the American Association of University Pre uh, Professors. He's a faculty advisor for the OSU chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine. Uh, broadly speaking, his research and teaching focus on post-colonial studies and um, critical ethnic studies. The courses he teaches look at the literatures, cultures, and histories of colonized and formerly colonized people in Asia, in Africa, in the Caribbean, in Ireland, and people of color in the United States. His research um, focuses on South Asia and the South Asian diaspora, along with Marxist theories of nationalism and colonialism, and the sort of intersecting uh, legacies of colonialism, settler colonialism, and slavery. So thank you so much, Prana, for, for joining us here today. Um, and then I also just want to thank our ASL interpreters for um, for interpreting for us today. So I thought I might um, ask uh, Pranav to um, start us off with the uh, the first question, and uh, we can take it away from there. Sure. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me all right. Um, so first of all, I just want to say how much of an honor it is to be here with Omar Barghouti, co-founder of the BDS movement. Um, and it's just just a real uh, inspiration and, a, and, and an honor. Um, uh, thanks so much for to JVP for organizing this event. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the SJP chapter at Ohio State, which has done some fantastic organizing in the last few horrible weeks um, of, uh, you know, in Columbus, Ohio, and, and uh, their leadership uh, has been second to none. So I just want to want to, um, uh, you know, thank them for, for all of that, all of that work and that effort. Um, today, I think the, the title in Omar's uh, Peace in the Nation, um, you know, that, that, that all, all we need is, is some courage, right, from the people of the world at this moment, um, that, that, that has to be uh, visible and, and demonstrable, and we have to uh, show it like never before, right? 
Um, and, and I think those that topic and BDS and the, the, the questions of politics and strategy will, will, will probably be the main things we talk about um, um, today. But I wanted to start, Omar, by just asking you about some of your, um, just your personal emotions during this recent massacre and, and, and you know, hope, without going into, into two personal things, you know, just, just our hope that you're well and, and your, your loved ones are well. But uh, if you can say a little bit about that aspect of, of you know, just, just the last few weeks and, and what it's been like for you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amy, JVP, for inviting me. Sa thanks so much, uh, Pranav, uh, for this. I'm honored to be with all of you uh, to speak to uh, such a diverse uh, audience in the United States. Um, as some of you know, since a couple of years ago, since Trump uh, denied me entry to the US, I have not been able to travel to the US. And until now, I don't know. I have not tested the waters yet with the current administration. Um, the last uh, few weeks uh, have been really difficult for every Palestinian, uh, but they were also a source of pride. Uh, and it's this mix of uh, feeling uh, distraught, feeling um, absolutely devastated with the sight of televised massacring of our people. And, and it's a televised massacre. I, I don't have any other term for it. Oh. Uh, uh, um, destroying families quite intentionally. And as an Israeli pilot uh, revealed not too long ago, they were doing it out of frustration, uh, uh, destroying some of those high rises, not because they were so-called military uh, targets. But what he did not say is that this is all part of uh, an actual official doctrine of it by the Israeli army since 2008 called the Dahia doctrine. Dahia refers to the southern suburb of Beirut uh, which was demolished uh, largely in 2006 in Israel's attack on Lebanon that year. Uh, th then it was developed in Tel Aviv University with the military industries and, and the leadership of Israel into a military doctrine. That basically, since Israel, though it's a nuclear power, extremely powerful army, cannot easily defeat irregular resistance forces, the most uh, effective way of hurting the resistance and making it stop is through disproportionate force applied to the civilians and civilian infrastructure. So it's the, it's called the doctrine of disproportionate force, uh, in fact. And that's exactly what they did in, in Gaza. So it was devastating. But what, what was most difficult for me was that I did not have time to grieve, literally. Um, I got extremely busy as a human rights defender in the BDS movement. It was exploding in a very positive way with in parallel with what's going on on the ground, with the devastation on the ground. Solidarity, meaningful solidarity, effective strategic solidarity was reaching new heights like never before. I've been an activist for many, many years. I've never seen anything like this before. It was, it's unprecedented. <clears throat> so that gives us a lot of hope. Uh -huh. uh, uh, but I did not have time to grieve. I have not had time to grieve yet. And this leaves something inside that's difficult to express, but it's this real difficult uh, mix, but it's mostly pride uh, about the unity of our people, our will to resist and our will to exist with dignity. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks so much, thanks so much. I, I think in, a, <clears throat> in so many scenarios, uh, we see this, uh, the same moment of the of the the tragedy and the horror um, creates the sense that this is the time to fight back and this is the time to speak and for individuals who are directly impacted by that horror that that movement from the the the, the need for the time to grieve and then also the need to speak and the need to organize is just it's just um, I think many people don't maybe recognize that, you know, um, and, and, and thanks for, thanks for bringing that out. Um, in terms of that moment of hope, I think, I think many of us have felt that same exact thing that this is a, you know, what's going on almost, <laughs> you know, what is it with so many really strong solidarity statements, you know, so many really, uh, really righteous um, displays of it. And, and so there's a sense of a new you know, a new moment. And, and I was, I was just asking on the broadest level, you know, how, 
how, on those lines, um, how can we define that new moment? You know, why? What's new? What What has happened? You know, is it if it's even possible? <laughs> Uh, what 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 is it new? What's what's happened so that so that there's a different response this time? I think there are quite a few factors. The most important factor is that um, we are planting seeds all the time, nourishing them, and you can never guess when they will flourish, when the, you will they will yield uh, fruit, mm -hmm. and you'll pick up your olives. Uh, Palestinians are very patient. We plant olive trees and we wait years and years. Olive trees take forever <laughs> to, to yield fruit. Uh, so Palestinians have learned a lot of patience. And, and in the BDS movement, we, we carry on with this patience. We, we plant a lot of seeds. And many of, of the solidarity groups, many groups that have been building this movement for years and years have been working patiently so hard uh, and sometimes almost giving up you look at the US Congress and it's so easy to give up hope. But if you go beyond the surface and see what's going on at the grassroots level in the last 10 years, in the last five years in particular, you can see the writing on the wall. You can see change happening gradually. No one could guess any tipping point. By definition, it's a tipping point. No one knows exactly when it will happen. But I think we've, we've built up quite well to a tipping point building power at the grassroots level, at mm -hmm. the civil society level. And we created with our partners globally, the tools for meaningful solidarity. Mm -hmm. That's what BDS has offered this time around. Basically that it's not enough to express rage or uh, being indignant or being uh, even ashamed. Uh, uh, it's not enough, that's a first step. Mm -hmm. The next step is end complicity. BDS is first and foremost about ending complicity, not charity. So going to the street and demonstrating is wonderful, but then what? Your institutions, your state, your city, your corporations are the reason why Israel's regime of military occupation, settler colonialism and apartheid manages to, to do, to perpetrate a televised massacre in Gaza. There are reasons. So, so everyone has a moral obligation to act. And that's what we, we called for. We need that courage. Palestinians are, 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 are shattering the walls of fear, intimidation, and hopelessness every single day. Mm -hmm. and, and we need a shattering of that wall of intimidation and fear among many people <coughs> around the world. And that started to happen. So I think I think that there, there are many other factors, but but basically that was a key point, and the unity that Palestinians have shown like never before, uh, and the savageness, the savagery with which the Israeli system, including the armed settlers, the mobs, have tried to uh, uh, suppress us, to repress us, mm -hmm. has been also um, I wouldn't say unprecedented, but has been. Uh, on television for, for all to see. Uh, I, th I think Israel still thinks it's in the Trump era. They have not received the memo that Trump is gone. And with that, th th there's a sea change happening, not yet in Congress, but it's also beginning in Congress. With Congresswoman Cory Bush, with, with, with people like that, you can see change happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over to Amy, but I'm... Right. I'm just thinking about that, um, you know, the, the almost the flip, right? The, the, the televised massacre has its other side, which is everyone sees what's going on and there's no way, no way to hide. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Amy. Yeah, I mean, but by all means, jump in. So I, I think I want to unpack a little bit more some of the steps that you've already um, taken us through. So, so before this recent massacre, um, in Gaza, what what was your sense of where the majority view of of Palestinians um, was was lying, um, politically speaking? I think many Palestinians. Um, if you take a snapshot, and this is something I've written about, I've I've talked about quite a lot. Uh, Palestinians, like many indigenous people under settler colonial rule, if you take a snapshot at a given moment you can see despondency, you can see hopelessness. You take a snapshot at another moment and you see 
people being jubilant and, and, and hopeful and so on. So it's very important not to trust uh, uh, snapshots, uh, to take snapshots as minor indicators of a process and to try to read the process. So I think most Palestinians were suffering uh, uh, tremendously escalating conditions of settler colonial uh, 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 force, uh, repression, uh, killings, uh, uh, destruction of uh, property, destruction of uh, agricultural lands, uh, the siege of Gaza is getting much worse, the disease and, and with COVID, uh, um, things were reaching a boiling point anyway. Uh, and um, the Israeli far right, which is now in government, it's no longer a fringe, the Israeli government is a far right government, and the next one promises to be just as far right, if not worse, uh, um, was oblivious to this. Even the Israeli intelligence community were telling the government, it's about to explode. We're squeezing people into smaller and smaller shrinking pieces of land, uh, uh, um, stealing their property, their land, and, and making their lives so miserable, which is something that Israel has been doing for 73 years, but not so fast, not so uh, bluntly. What do you expect people are about to explode? So you could see a lot of people hopeless, but yet about to explode. So it's that, again, that mix. Uh, uh, with, the, with the events in Sheikh Jarrah, the forced expulsions and continued uh, attempts to forcefully expel Palestinians from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah, um, and the attacks on worshippers in Al-Aqsa Mosque and the mosque uh, compound, things exploded. Things reached that boiling point. But they were, they, they were getting there for, for quite some time with the far-right government's uh, repression. Can you say a little bit more about this? So we've talked a little bit about Gaza. Um, how is it feeling for Palestinians in Israel? So I'm thinking about this vigilante violence um, by some Israelis, uh, by some Israeli Jews, uh, maybe Kahanists um, against Palestinians in Israel, sometimes in the occupied territories, but mostly. How is that um, impacting how um, Palestinians are thinking about uh, future, their future, yeah. Sure, um, without going into too many details about the history of Palestinian citizens of present day Israel, uh, but just very quickly, uh, um, many uh, participants would know that since the Nakba of 1948, since the destruction of Palestinian society to establish uh, an ethnocratic uh, Jewish supremacist state, a settler colony in Palestine, until 1966, Palestinians who remained in what became the state of Israel and ultimately got citizenship were under military rule. They were going through the exact same process that went on in, in, the, in, in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank in, after 67. Settlements, illegal colonies, uh, uh, theft of their land, uh, military rule, no freedom of movement, uh, everything needs a permit, and so on and so forth. Exactly what we're seeing in the West Bank today was applied to Palestinian citizens of, of the state of Israel. Uh, um, now, there's this um, uh, propaganda line, a talking point that the Israeli government has always said that, oh, we have Palestinians who are citizens. Look at them, they're in the parliament, in the Knesset. We have uh, uh, Arab judges. They don't call us Palestinians, Arab judges uh, in, in the courts in Israel and so on. So what are you talking about apartheid? You know, there is no apartheid. And you know, Jews and Arabs can sit at the same table in restaurants, unlike in South Africa, where blacks and whites could not share oh. a table. Um, of course, that it makes a mockery of the UN definition of apartheid, as Human Rights Watch recently said, as the mm -hmm. most prominent Israeli organization has said. So Palestinians in Israel are also part of this, living under this regime of apartheid, living under this settler colonial regime that kept treating them as though indigenous, as uh, unwanted citizens of the state. Because Israel, as many would know, is not a state of its citizens. It's not like the US. I mean, the US is not exactly an ideal democracy, but at least it doesn't claim to be a state of some citizens, but not others. Oh. It's the state of citizens, basically. There's discrimination in other ways, but not in the constitution. It doesn't, not the current constitution, at least. Israel does not even claim to be a state of its citizens. It's not, it's the state of the Jewish people defined as an extraterritorial uh, uh, concept. So Palestinians always felt that. And with, the, with that moment, Palestinians in Israel, citizens of the state of Israel, that uh, uh, decades of discrimination came to the fore. 
and they rediscovered the unity with the rest of the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. the, the, Go ahead. Yeah, no, the, the general strike was, was really remarkable to see. And um, I may be mistaken, but I don't remember seeing that kind of um, organizing before. What, is, that, is that a correct impression of the, the general strike as part of something that was new in, you know, among Palestinians themselves? In a qualitative sense, yes. We've had general strikes before across historic Palestine. Oh. Uh, 1948 territory, 1967, present day Israel, West Bank and Gaza. Oh. But not at this level oh. of grassroots unity and coordination. Uh, so in that sense, it is unprecedented, mm -hmm. uh, with Palestinian flags flying everywhere from Acre, Akka, Haifa, Lidda, uh, uh, Nazareth, Um al-Fahim, and so on, Jaffa, mm -hmm. of course, not just Jerusalem and the rest of the West Bank or Gaza, and, mm -hmm. and that, and of course, Palestinians in exile as well. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a, a revival of this unity that the Oslo peace process has worked very hard to, mm -hmm. to destroy, to, to shatter mm -hmm. this unity, to, to turn us into uh, um, uh, disparate groups of people with no national identity whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, we think the current uh, um, upheaval among Palestinians has, uh, has sent back that Israeli project of dividing Palestinians decades back. So mm -hmm. I think we're regaining our unity like never before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I think I wanted to ask, d does it feel like um, a single democratic state is more or less viable from that, that unified Palestinian standpoint after these recent events? Um, as a BDS activist, I must say that as a movement, the Palestinian-led boycott divestment sanctions movement does not take a position, Amy. On, on, on this issue. We don't take a position on one state, two states, five states. What BDS says is that no matter what the solution is, it must accommodate our basic rights under international law, which means an end to the 67 occupation, including East Jerusalem, an end to the system of apartheid, which is everywhere against all Palestinians, and the right of Palestinian refugees to return in accordance with UN resolutions and their inherent uh, rights. So whatever political solution is reached, it has to accommodate that. However, with my other hat, as, as someone who's researching, writing independently of the BDS movement, since 1983, I have personally advocated for a, a democratic unitary state uh, for everyone, including the refugees. Uh, and, and I'm not ashamed of that. I'm very proud of that position because I think it's the most ethical position, but that has nothing to do with the BDS movement, which, which is led by the broadest coalition Palestinian society. Therefore, by definition, it cannot take a position on one state or two states. But certainly now with this uh, uh, revival of unity, I think there's much more discussion about, not about one state because everyone is recognizing it is already one state under apartheid, under settler mm -hmm. colonialism. There are no two states. It's, it's, it's a European American, Israeli uh, uh, center-right myth. The far right doesn't believe in two states. I mean, the current government right. in Israel does not believe in two states. It's, it's a one state already. It's been one state for decades. Now is the time to transform it, to transcend settler colonialism and apartheid and build a true democracy. That's mm -hmm. my personal position, not the BDS movements, as I said. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think drawing out that distinction between uh, your personal position, with, which I also share um, from the BDS movement position is 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 useful and and it's it's useful to differentiate that and I I think it's also a good strategic way for the BDS movement not to you know to focus on the question of BDS right and not to be divided around is that is that behind that strategy well there are some very banal reasons as a huge coalition the Palestinian BDS National Committee. It's who's who in Palestinian civil society. It's really the largest Palestinian coalition. Mm -hmm. We couldn't agree on anything beyond the three basic rights mm -hmm. and the occupation and the part that right of return, period. If we venture beyond that, we would get into a lot of disagreements, but we've never had disagreements because we stuck, we, we, we really upheld three planks mm -hmm. in our program. 
That's the most banal reason. But there's another strategic reason, which is it's not up to people around the world to decide for Palestinians what the future should be. Self-determination means we determine our future as as the indigenous people of the land. Ultimately, we and our settler colonial Mm -hmm. uh, 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 colonialists must reach some solution, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, be it the South African solution or some other solution, but it has to be a solution that's worked out in the region, Mm -hmm. mainly by by Palestinians determining what the future should look like. Mm -hmm. People outside have an obligation uh, 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 to end complicity. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to support one state or two states to realize that your university has investments in companies helping the occupation, that Mm -hmm. your state is is doing a deadly exchange between your police force and the Israeli police learning the worst of both practices Mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And your country, your, your, the United States, is the biggest partner in crime with mm-hmm. Israel. So, so that entails an obligation to act, regardless of the intellectual academic discussion in the US or in Europe about one state or two states. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to ask about a few BDS campaigns. But before we did that, I just didn't want to leave like the most recent events. So I, did, I didn't know if there were any other uh, reflections you wanted to share on Sheikh Jarrah. Um, so from again, from a, a U.S. perspective, um, it, it looks to me as though this is um, an effort to, to repossess property on some historical grounds of property ownership um, that would open the door to Palestinians um, similarly claiming a right to repossess property. And that might doesn't make right, but somehow the paper, paper trail does. So I didn't know if um, if you had anything more you wanted to, to share about that. Actually, there's a lot of misunderstanding, Amy, about that. Um, I attended a lecture by a Palestinian historian from Jerusalem who explained the facts about Sheikh Jarrah uh, very quickly. Some Jewish families pre-state, before uh, the Nakba, before the destruction of Palestinian society, had rented long-term lease from Palestinian, it was the Palestinian bourgeoisie, the rich Palestinians who had villas in Sheikh Jarrah, they're owned by rich Palestinians. So they had rented, they had leases for very long periods, 80 years, I think it was. Not ownership, they never owned, they were renting. Uh, But regardless, those Jewish families who left uh, during the takeover, during uh, the, the Nakba, um, they, they're they not the ones claiming that we have, you know, the remaining of our lease. There are other Jewish settlers that have nothing to do with them. So what Israel is saying, as always, as the Zionist movement always says, the Jews own those houses. There is no the Jews. It's, it's like, imagine a Chinese person having a building in San Francisco and then passing away and then a hundred years later, Chinese people in general going claiming that building that is belongs to the Chinese. Mm-hmm. It would be ludicrous in any context, except in Israel. It's yeah, the Jews own this. What do you mean the Jews? That's such an anti-Semitic concept, reducing every Jewish person into the Jews. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is not very different than all the other anti-Semitic tropes. So it's not like there was a, you know a communal ownership First, it's rental, not ownership. And second, it's not the Jews owning it. It's a Jewish family owning, uh, renting this particular home. So there's a lot of that. But you're right about the other part. If Israel wants to go that path and claim ownership by some families and somehow find some familial connections, well, Palestinians owned all of West Jerusalem or most of West Jerusalem, not to mention the rest of the country, Jaffa and Haifa and Ma'aka and Safat and, and so on and so forth. Yes, they, they need reparations. They need to get back their property by international law, by the way. I mean, it's not like uh, uh, an Israeli charitable act. By international law, Palestinians have a right to their property. So uh, what do you want? Cool. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, thank, thank so much for, for that, Omar. Um, I wanted to turn to, well, I have two things. <laughs> Actually, I have several things listed here. I'm not sure which one to take first. I guess since we're talking about BDS and we're talking about um, our responsibility, those of us who are um, out on the outside, you know, um, for ending complicity, right? I think that that slogan you gave today is really memorable, right? 
these institutions are already complicit. These governments are already complicit and, and we have to end that. And that's our responsibility, right? Um, I think that's, that's um, something that I'll definitely remember and use in our organizing. But that question of fear, you know, that comes up. Um, and I'm talking about fear of different kinds. And you address this in your article in The Nation, um, citing Edward Said, you know, that the fear that, and that that fear is starting to break. And I definitely feel that. Um, there were people who I was talking to at rallies here the other day who were leading the chants. And um, some of them many years ago would not have done that, you know, because of that fear. Um, and, and that you can see that changing, you know. Um, and, uh, and yet it remains, right? One of the biggest obstacles is, um, is that. And of course, if you're Palestinian, you get it in a way that uh, is unimaginably direct and there's no question about that. But then it also applies to others who are not Palestinian, but who are taking a stand. Um, and it has some real consequences, right? Um, as we've seen. So what are some of the, you know, and of course this is a conversation, um, but in your mind, what are some of the, the best ways to address that question of why, what I've been saying is that everyone doesn't need to speak up the same way, but you need to find the way you can speak up, right? So not talk about all the things you can't do, but what can you do? And to put your mind towards that effort right now, especially right now, what can you do? What are some other ways we can think about challenging that fear? Uh, speaking up or acting up. Uh, some people may not need to speak mm -hmm. uh, if they feel uh, unsafe to speak. Uh, uh, junior academics who don't have tenure do not need to speak, do not need to use their names, but they can act mm -hmm. uh, without, without jeopardizing their careers. Uh, uh, as they currently would, um, uh, junior artists, junior activists, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so, so, yes, we are in a different moment, and we owe a lot, we owe huge gratitude to Black Lives Matter. Uh -huh. They brought us here. Without the movement for Black Lives, we would not be here at this uh -huh. moment in the United States, in the United uh -huh. Kingdom, uh -huh. and elsewhere. They helped shatter a lot of the fear around systemic racism and taboo issues, not Palestine, but taboo issues, period, that this white supremacist United States has to face up to its history, uh, centuries of genocide, ethnic cleansing, slavery, Jim Crow, and suppression in more democratic, uh, insidious ways uh, um, uh, of of the black minority, of, of Latino, Latina minority, of other minorities, Asian minorities, and so on, but especially the anti-blackness, the white supremacy, with shattering or beginning to shatter that taboo, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter just opened the door for all of us, mm -hmm. for all oppressed communities to, 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 to demand shattering the taboo on our right as well. So, so I think Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives have revived uh, the most wonderful rich heritage of black internationalism, black mm. American internationalism uh, mm -hmm. for Angela Davis and Malcolm X and, 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 and so on and so forth. There, mm. There's a history, a, a very rich history of black internationalism in the, in the US. And that has opened the doors to many oppressed communities, including mm. Palestinians. Okay. So we owe a huge thank you uh, to, to the movement for black lives. So what people can do to, to quickly mm -hmm. answer that part of the question is that, yes, you're absolutely right. Everyone acts in their own sphere and, and do what they can to end complicity because of the ethical obligation to act. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the, the obligation uh, um, uh, goes higher or lower depending mm -hmm. on your position in power. Okay. If I'm a powerless person, I don't have much of an obligation to do anything because, I mean, yes, the United States is sending Israel $3.8 billion in military funding annually, and it's mm -hmm. my tax money. But, you know, if I'm a poor, single uh, uh, parent that is oppressed and there's mm -hmm. an intersection of oppressions, race, mm -hmm. class, gender, and so on, I have much less of a responsibility to act to end mm -hmm. this complicity than mm -hmm. someone who's more 
privileged. Mm -hmm. So with, with, with the increase of privilege, the ethical obligation increases to act to end uh, uh, complicity. Mm -hmm. A tenured professor have, has more of an obligation to act to end their university's investments in apartheid uh, Israel, as we had an obligation to, to get our universities when I was in the US studying, to get mm -hmm. the trustees to divest from apartheid South Africa. So mm -hmm. it's, it's that obligation. That's right. You know, today, June 1st, um, is the 100th anniversary of a, a white mob um, going into what was then called, um, in some communities, a Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And even though there were, you know, efforts 20 years ago to um, unearth and tell this story, originally, um, it's really only coming to, to consciousness, broadly speaking, on, on the US news and whatnot, um, today, 100 years later. I, I wonder, um, and, and so I, I think that there, there's still a huge amount of work that, that needs to be done to, to just tell the story, let alone to um, reduce or eliminate anti-Blackness in the United States. Um, is that a way forward for um, something like um, a, a multinational state um, in, in the region? Or uh, is, there, is there a different kind of way that you, that you see every day um, Jewish Israeli and, and Palestinian Israelis um, coming to see themselves as part of a, a common political community? Unfortunately, no, we don't see that. Um... There's a huge difference because Israel is a settler colony that is still actively denying it's a settler colony. Mm -hmm. uh, would not, will not admit it's the history of the Nakba. There's total denial of the Nakba among the absolute majority of Jewish uh, Israelis. Uh, the far right has massive power, uh, democratic power. They were elected. It's not like they were installed like a dictatorship. No, they were democratically elected by the absolute majority of Jewish Israelis. So unfortunately, uh, I wish it were only the Kahanists, uh, um, you know, the fascists, proper fascists, so to speak, attacking the Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, the communities in, in Lidda, uh, Ramle, Yaffa, and elsewhere. It's not. It's, it's much wider than that. And they're protected by the police, uh, uh, if not encouraged by the police. I mean, and, and on video after video, you could see the police not just looking the other way, coordinating. Uh, protecting the settlers, the mobs, while they're attacking Palestinian, indigenous Palestinian communities. So no, there is no feeling of any civic unity there because Israel doesn't even attempt to claim that it belongs to its citizens, that Palestinian citizens of the state are equals. Uh, uh, Israel's, Israel's constitutional laws, it doesn't have a constitution, but it has laws, basic laws with constitutional power they don't mention equality. It's not in the Israeli constitutional mind, this equality it does not exist because it's the Jewish state. It's a Jewish supremacist state. It cannot by definition uh, provide equality to non-Jews, even if they're the indigenous people of the land. So there, how under those conditions can there ever be any uh, evolution of a civic identity uniting people regardless of their ethnicity, religion, and so on? It's impossible. So we've got to dismantle the system of racial uh, 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 discrimination, the segregation, the apartheid system and the settler colonial system in order to open some possibility for mm -hmm. ethical coexistence beyond a decolonial uh, uh, ethical coexistence beyond settler colony, that, that beyond apartheid. There is, then there's a possibility of, of an ethical coexistence, but not before dismantling the structures mm -hmm. of oppression. Mm -hmm. Do you see, um... Some of the people that we've been talking to here in Central Ohio um, are eager to have, a, a, and this I think Pranav has already spoken to, a, they're eager to see a kind of rebirth in a, uh, the Palestinian diaspora um, and its involvement um, directly in Palestine. And do you see this as a moment in which um, some kind of ANC style PLO uh, might be rebuilt? Or um, is, is that something that you think is valuable? needed? Yeah. It is valuable. It is needed. Absolutely. I've been personally advocating for quite some time for uh, taking back the PLO. It's, it belongs to the Palestinian people. It doesn't belong to any bureaucratic unelected leadership. It, it, it is our PLO. It's the Palestine Liberation Organization representing the entire Palestinian people everywhere. 
50% of the Palestinian people are in exile. They're not in historic Palestine, 50%. Uh, and of course, the internally displaced Palestinians within historic Palestine being a huge minority, the absolute majority of Palestinians are refugees or internally displaced persons and exilic communities. So you're absolutely right, Amy. This is a moment where this unity, this, this, the revival of this Palestinian unity uh, absolutely includes Palestinians in exile uh, in the diaspora. Yes, without them, there is no Palestinian unity. Mm -hmm. So how do we go about that? It's a very, very fraught, very difficult process of how to rebuild the PLO institutions from the bottom up in a grassroots, democratic, inclusive way that is also intersectional, that, that, uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that is uh, uh, not just geared toward national liberation, but also social justice, mm -hmm. gender justice, uh, economic justice, uh, uh, queer justice, climate justice, and so on. So those issues have become not secondary. They're very much part of this liberation struggle. So I think, yes, uh, exilic communities have a major role to play in uh, reviving this PLO from the grassroots up, democratizing it and taking it back to really speak for all of us. Mm. Did you want to come in on this, Pranav? I had another question, but I wasn't certain. Um, well, I was thinking of something from the previous discussion. So I don't want, didn't want to, um, you know, jump around too much but um if you have something on the same topic then go ahead and then i wanted to say something about black lives matter as oh, well yeah no BTS go ahead thing. yeah please oh, no. go ahead you, you sure yeah all right um omar the point you made about um you know i said i had several questions here i didn't know which one to go to and <laughs> the next one was that black lives matter and you yourself brought it up so I, you know i'm glad for that that point is very much, um, I mean, it's so true. <laughs> Last summer's protests around George Floyd's murder opened up such a space, you know, um, not only for the movement around Black lives, but for so many other oppressed groups. The awareness for the first time that I can remember in my life, the awareness of anti-Asian racism and the thinking about how does that connect, you know, to um, black oppression, native oppression, you know, how does it con connect in that way? I have not seen that kind of public interest on that question. Um, there was a sense that Asians are more or less white, you know, and we, and we <laughs> don't have to talk about anti-Asian racism as such, you know, and so there was a new eagerness to say, what are the different dimensions around white supremacy and let's tackle them all, you know, um, and connections between different movements um, while the mainstream media tried to fragment us, you know, against, against one another. And I see that same wave then connecting with the growth uh, around Palestine solidarity and this sense of, well, what about imperialism <laughs> and not just connecting to, you know, white supremacy sort of at home, right? But it's global, um, uh, roots and all of that. So, so I think that's really true. And one of the things I've been uh, thinking about, and that has been tried in different places, and I wonder if you could comment on this, is pairing together like the fight to divest from Israel with the fight to divest from private prisons, um, and of course, climate justice. And sometimes I think place to place, things are different strategically. You know, should you focus on one question? or should you make these connections? And I think at Ohio State, we've seen both attempts. We've seen the attempt to focus only on the question of divestment from Israel. And at times, you know, to pair together, um, you know, the, the different topics, but, but in that pairing together, sometimes what happens is while you build a broader coalition, um, sometimes you don't talk precisely enough about Israel, you know, um, and, and precisely enough about private prisons, because they're distinct as well, you know. So I was wondering in your thoughts or your experience, um, again, local strategies are always local. But if you if you have some, you know, some some comment on, on those kinds of strategies around BDS and, you know, kind of practically bringing the movements together. Uh, sure. The BDS movement as a Palestinian-led movement, of course, uh, has an operational principle called context sensitivity 
which mm -hmm. means we defer to partners in any context to decide mm -hmm. what works best, what mm -hmm. strategy works best in their context, mm -hmm. so long as the general guidelines are respected, general Palestinian rights and the general anti-racist inclusive guidelines of the movement are respected. Mm -hmm. But throughout our work in the United States, especially with Students for Justice in Palestine across US campuses, and of course, Jewish Voice for Peace chapters across campuses and many, many, many other allies, American Muslims for Palestine and, uh, and many church groups and uh, progressive Asian groups and, mm -hmm. and black groups and so on and so forth. Uh, huge intersectional coalitions were built uh, on in many uh, cases uh, mm -hmm. um, calling for divestment. Mm -hmm. I've personally seen the most effective efforts were intersectional mm -hmm. and that and were gradual in, in, in the sense that they uh, understood that we can pass a good BDS resolution at the student government level on tens of US campuses. Now we have this much power mm -hmm. as a movement to pass BDS resolutions across tens of campuses in the United States, including some of the biggest universities mm -hmm. at the student government level. However, implementing that, uh, uh, converting those uh, um, resolutions at the student government level to pressure on trustees to mm -hmm. compel them to divest, mm -hmm. there's a huge gap. Mm -hmm. And with the US uh, um, educational system becoming much more corporate, mm -hmm. much more uh, where corporations are very involved, mm -hmm. uh, the power structure requires intersectionality. It's not a matter of principle only. It's a very pragmatic, needed, essential consideration. Mm -hmm. Without connecting struggles together mm -hmm. to dismantle those divestment uh, uh, guidelines that universities adopt, which is profit, 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 mm -hmm. with no, uh, total, they're totally oblivious to mm -hmm. human rights, to racism, to coloniality, to imperialism. Mm -hmm. They don't give a damn. It's maximizing mm -hmm. profits. Mm -hmm. That's what they see their fiduciary responsibility to be, maximize profits at any cost. Mm -hmm. Well, no, if we all unite, we can force them to adopt ethical guidelines of procurement, mm -hmm. ethical guidelines for investment, that apply to all across the board, no investment in oppression, no investment in human rights violations, be it anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, or anti-Palestinian apartheid, or whatever the case may be. Just mm. no investment or fossil fuels or so on. The mm. Columbia University student strike, for example, connected both, connected the, the, the fossil fuel issue, divestment from fossil fuels, and divestment from apartheid, mm. and workers' rights. So they could, it was beautifully intersectional. Mm -hmm. They've done similar things in, in the, on the West Coast, at NYU, and, and many other campuses. So mm -hmm. I think the intersectional approach is, is more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And ethically, it's much more robust. And pragmatically, it's just much, much more powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We've had some interest in the chat for you to, to maybe offer an update if you have one on the HP boycott. I think I think it might be nice to kind of walk through maybe a boycott and a divestment campaign and the sanctions. And I have some examples, but I, I wondered if we could start there with the HP. Sure. Uh, HP is, is a, thanks for the question. It's a very good example, actually. As everyone knows, uh, HP uh, has split into several companies. Uh, they, they share the brand and they sh stockholders share a lot. Uh, so it's still part of a conglomerate, uh, more or less. Uh, we treat it as a single company after all, despite the split because of those uh, uh, reasons. And we've published about that. Regardless, HP corporations uh, were involved in many violations of Palestinian rights uh, in the Israeli uh, military um, settlements and so on the biometric systems used by the Israeli military at the checkpoints, the military checkpoints to oppress Palestinians and prevent them, deny them freedom of movement were HP systems. Not anymore. HP has pulled out of that business. Mm -hmm. uh, in the settlements and the checkpoints, we, don't, we no longer see HP equipment, but HP remains one of the most complicit companies because they provide the computer system to the Israeli uh, Ministry of Interior uh, uh, Registry of Citizens and Residents, which is where apartheid is, co is, is controlled. That's the apartheid control room, if you will. Uh, those the IDs, Israeli IDs that say if you're Arab or Jew or, or you know, they, they assign these identities and accordingly the rights that you earn or the, the rights that you deserve uh, under this, the, the system of apartheid. So HP is extremely involved in Israeli apartheid, no less. And of course, they have computer uh, uh, 
contracts with the Israeli military still. Uh, so HP has pulled out to an extent, but it's still deeply invested in apartheid. And that's why we're going after them. We call for divestment, we call for boycotts of HP. Every student who has a, an HP printer can just not buy ink. And when the printer goes bad, just throw it in the garbage and buy a non-complicit printer, similar for, for computers and so on. But of course, divestment remains the most important. Uh, when the Presbyterians in 2014 decided to divest from HP, that was a huge blow because it's the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, uh, so we need much more of that. We need universities, we need big institutions to just boycott or divest from HP. So that's a campaign that's growing. It's a global campaign. And actually the coordinator is, is based in India. Mm -hmm. and, and one might think, why India? It's coincidental, it, it wasn't intentional. But in India, the largest student union with 4 million members, something to envy in the US, 4 million <laughs> members, part of a student union, uh, have endorsed the BDS campaign against HP. Uh, so we have a lot of support in India for the HP boycott. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so one of the um, young Jewish organizations in the United States, if not now, um, has started talking about defund um, the occupation. Do, do you see there um, to be any um, difference between d divestment um, and defunding? I think they're all related. They belong to the same family, and that's the context sensitivity uh, concept that I that I shared. Uh, so, um, if not now, is working with a certain demographic, a certain constituency, where this slogan is the most effective, and th that's great. That's fine. Ultimately. We want to end U.S. military funding to Israel, okay. plus a few, plus quite a few other uh, ways of the U.S. is complicit. But the biggest form of complicity of the United States is the military funding to Israel, the 3.8 billion dollars. Increasingly, especially with the movement for Black Lives and 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 what's what's happening in the U.S., people are connecting. It's not that the 3.8 billion sent to Israel every year to buy weapons, to kill Palestinians and to occupy and to cut olive trees will do anything major in the US. But increasingly progressives are connecting the dots. It's the militarization that we have to tackle. It's the entire militarization of the US domestically and US militarization as an imperial power outside. It's uh, the killing and oppression of brown and black people uh, outside and uh, uh, systemic racism inside and denial of indigenous rights uh, inside the United States. They're very connected. So now there's a campaign that was launched recently, Demilitarize US to Palestine, which connects those dots. And it says defunding militarized police in the US, defunding those uh, 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 law enforcement agencies in the US and, and the brutality and the systemic racism is very much connected to defunding Israeli apartheid. Uh, the brutality there and the brutality here, the racism there and the, the racism here have a lot of parallels and, and, and much more than we even see at this point. Mm -hmm. So demilitarize US to Palestine is one idea. The if not now idea is another. Um, many are doing uh, congressional lobbying, calling for conditioning aid, for example, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rather than ending aid. They feel that at this moment, we cannot really get a lot of traction with cutting military funding, maybe conditioning. Uh, funding. And that's also a context sensitive uh, uh, slogan that can work. Yeah, that, that was calling to my mind. Is this Betty McCollum's bill, No Child Left Behind? Uh, are you thinking about that kind of? Uh, and the newer and the newer bill that goes beyond that, that, that uh, uh, no funding for annexation, no funding for settlements, and not just for uh, oppression of Palestinian children. Uh, uh, the broader bill that also uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum is leading with other Congress members is excellent in that sense because it does call attention, it does have, a, it does spotlight the issue that the U.S. is funding that oppression, be it the, the de facto annexation, the de jure annexation, the ongoing settlement construction, which is illegal, it's a war crime under international law, the siege of Gaza. This is all made in the USA. This is all funded by the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's not just against international law, it's against U.S. law. The Leahy law mm -hmm. should prevent sending weapons, sell, selling weapons to any state that's committing egregious human rights violations like Israel does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we were talking about is 
whether there is a more ro like a more robust possibility for sanctions. But your your thought is that if we're looking like realistically at the lay of the land, pushing for U.S. sanctions is but conditioning aid is you think is kind of the more pragmatic strategy. Um, it's not up to me to decide mm. from afar. I mean, we in Palestine cannot uh, understand the U.S. reality as much as our U.S. partners. So Jewish Voice for Peace and, and uh, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights and uh, AFSC and, and uh, all the other groups working uh, in, in Washington, lobbying and so on, and connected to the grassroots because, as everyone understands, there is no change in Congress without grassroots power. In the South African struggle, I personally was active in the anti-apartheid, uh, South African anti-apartheid struggle when I went to school at Columbia. And we understood even then, back in the mm -hmm. 80s, in the dark ages, that we couldn't change Congress without building power from the grassroots up. It was a Black-led movement, and we did build power from the grassroots mm -hmm. up, from every student group, churches and unions and, and women's groups and feminists and so on, until it started affecting city councils and then states and then Congress. Because otherwise, Congress will not wake up and become mm -hmm. more moral all of a sudden. It's an imperialist Congress predominantly, with, with a few exceptions, it will not be anti-imperialist suddenly. It did not drop apartheid South Africa until it had to, when it was compelled. So we have to compel it. I, I'm, I'm getting, um, anyway, I have a lot of thoughts going on in my head around this, this question of um, conditional, you know, um, this kind of conditional reduction of aid kind of thing, because it really comes back to that, you know, that strategy question we talked about earlier around uh, one state, two state, et cetera, and BDS not taking a stance definitively on that in order to combine the partners. And I can see how some people who only want to talk about the post-67 occupation as, you know, that they see that as a thing to fight right, not the whole thing, might be drawn to a certain kind of bill or reform that's conditional on, you know, that particular question of settlements, whereas others who feel like we need to talk about settler colonialism as a whole might not want to, might see the conditional as too much of a compromise, you know, to, the, to that position. And so it really has to be worked out on the ground, right? Who are the forces and what's possible? Um, on the one hand, moving the needle to take the next step, but on the other hand, recognizing that some of the people who argue for moving the needle actually don't want to end settler colonialism. They want to limit the struggle, you know? So there's a, it's a complex kind of working out on the ground, I, I guess. That's so, why. No. I agree, but I don't see a contradiction between our discourse mm -hmm. and our strategies. Mm -hmm. In other words, when the BDS movement was launched in 2005, even then we had an apartheid analysis. It was not popular, even in Palestinian society. Mm -hmm. I mean, the entire society signed on to the BDS call, but mm -hmm. did everyone truly, truly understand fully and completely agree with the apartheid analysis? No. Mm -hmm. They trusted the activists and they trusted the, the, the unity and so on, and they went for it. Mm -hmm. But now it's becoming much more mainstream. So mm -hmm. our discourse that Israel is a settler colony and an occupier and mm -hmm. an apartheid state, a combination, mm -hmm. uh, was not extremely popular back then mm -hmm. in 2005. Mm -hmm. Now you see in the New York Times and Washington Post articles talking about settler colonialism and apartheid. Right. Right. Suddenly, suddenly, you know, it's controversial, but it's okay. Right. Controversial, right. not like <laughs> beyond the pale. And right. suddenly, it, well, it's not suddenly. Because some of us have been working on the day, uh, working on this day in and day out. Our partners in the US have been working on this. So the discourse, we got the discourse right and we started mainstreaming it, popularizing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But the strategizing is a completely different game. Yeah. Uh, strategizing, it's how to get from A to B. Mm -hmm. uh, how, to, how, how I get from A to B affects everything. So I don't need to change my principles. Israel has been, will always be a settler colony and an apartheid state. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. But I can go to Congress, and my demand is dismantle apartheid and settler colonialism. Uh, people will ask, you know, what I had for breakfast. Uh, it's something weird, uh, because it's it's we're not romantic. We're not idealistic. We're activists. We know that we want to achieve 
Palestinian rights. So we've got to be strategic. It's an ethical obligation to be strategic. Unlike what some people say, if I'm strategic, I'm selling out. No, keep the principle. You're not, you never sell out the principles. The principle, it's a settler colony that has to be dismantled. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Palestinians will never accept an apartheid say, state or a settler colonial state. We will never, until the last Palestinian, we will never accept settler colonialism or apartheid. But how we pursue certain strategies in, in, in certain corridors of power, the corridor of power in Congress, mm -hmm. must be strategic and must take into account the balance of power in, in that place, where we stand and what we can achieve. But so long as those leading the movement are principled and we won't be co-opted or and we won't sell out, then we're safe. Then there's no possibility of you know giving us some crumbs and saying, yeah, live with it. No, we won't live with it. We'll take your crumbs and ask for the ask for more. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I might have lost some of his audio. Well, he may come back. This is just an, a good opportunity. I'm the real that... thing. Oh, good. Can you hear? Can you hear me now? We now can. we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't know where you lost me, but I, I was saying that uh, uh, as long as the leadership of this BDS movement right. Right. It is principled, mm -hmm. we're not selling out. We will not be co-opted. Mm -hmm. Whatever strategy we adopt mm -hmm. will be a gradual, sustainable strategy, but always going up. We know mm -hmm. we never go back. And we, we adopt Desmond to, Archbishop Desmond Tutu's slogan, we want the full menu of rights, ultimately. Thank you. So uh, this is a good opportunity for thank me you, to just- Thank you so much, so yeah, much for that. I want to um, just tell people, if you are named Eugenia Cutler, we just had some technical problem with our Zoom link. So if you are named Eugenia Cutler, if you could rename yourself, especially if you were interested in, in asking a question, um, Omar has agreed to, to take questions directly from from people here um, and I wanted to also you know let you know that um, if you would like to ask a question you know put your name in the chat and and we can see if we have time um, at this moment I, I just um, I know that there's a question from David Mandel but I didn't know Pranav if you had a follow-up there no I just wanted to thank Omar for that um, just that just that great and and clear explanation about principles and strategy and how they relate to each other um, and, and so that people don't get tripped up on that, right? But remain very clear as to what our principle is, that never changes, right? Even if it's unpopular, that never changes. And at the same time, there are certain practical things we have to do with certain groups of people and they won't change until the entire system, system changes. You can't, there's a, you know, so, that, so how do you deal with that, that reality? You know, and bring people to the way I see it is bring people to BDS, even if because they understand that ethical reason for it, even if they they're, they're still learning about a lot of things and processing about a lot of things. I think people can see that televised massacre and understand, you know, the need to uh, not fund that apartheid state anymore. You know, so I think I think um, thanks for that very clarifying answer. Um, David Mandel, did you want to ask your question? I think I may sure. have. Sure, yeah, you unmuted me. Hi, hi, Omar, good to see you. Hi, David. Um, and uh, sorry, I was late. Stop me if this has been asked, but I assume it hasn't since you're calling on me. I, I really wanted to ask, now that the um, apartheid framework and analysis is becoming much more widespread among uh, many people, not only us more radical folks, um, and the implication of that is that there really is one country uh, and that it's, it's a one state apartheid reality. Um, is it time for perhaps the civil society groups that, that called for BDS to take the step that they refrained from in the past and start talking more about what kind of vision they have for the future in terms of what type of state there should be and what would be, what would be the relationship between Palestinians and Jews, um, what type of democracy makes sense to have? Um, and I, I know that the JVP also has refrained from doing that uh, so far, but I think a lot more people are talking about, well, maybe maybe it's time to try to, to lay out um, a different vision and, 
as opposed to only um, denouncing the current reality. You were really late, David, because we discussed this uh, oh. not too long ago. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. We, we, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no I, I, I no assumed problem. that you wouldn't have called on me I'm, if you had. But, okay. No, no problem. But just just to recap very very quickly, uh, maybe others were late as well. Is that uh, it's not in the BDS movement. In the BDS movement, as the largest coalition in Palestinian society, even if we wanted to, we cannot reach agreement on what uh, the political solution should look like one state or two states, it's a huge coalition. So even if this issue were raised, it hasn't been, but even if it were raised, we cannot reach consensus and it will divide the movement. And the Palestinian BDS National Committee's unity is extremely important in leading the global BDS movement. The other issue related to that is that it's up to Palestinians to decide. You're right, Palestinian society has to decide. Uh, um, it's not up to the international solidarity movement to decide for Palestinians whether it should be one state or, or two states, because the most urgent uh, uh, task at hand outside Palestine, outside historic Palestine, is ending complicity. And that does not demand uh, supporting one state or two states. It demands recognizing complicity, institutional, corporate, and state complicity, and working to end that. Uh, but of course, you're right that th the needle is shifting on that issue. It's becoming much less of a taboo there's more recognition that it's already one state under apartheid, as you rightly said. And in, more and more people are saying, well, if it's apartheid, look what happened in South Africa. It was democratized. Can the same be done? A lot more people are saying that. Thanks. Um, Weidad Schlot, I see you um, have raised your hand. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yes, thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. My name is Widad. I'm an American from Iraq, uh, vice president of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. Thank you very much, uh, Omar and JVP. Um, I have never seen so much solidarity for the Palestinian movement. Uh, in San Diego, California, the, uh, the Palestinian youth movement and Majdal Center have been holding continuous solidarity protest with over 14 uh, organizations speaking up and joining us during this. So I, uh, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful. My question, uh, uh, Omar, is how much prospect of getting rid of Hamas and the Palestinian government in the West Bank and replacing them with a popular, democratic, reasonable governments to truly represent Palestinians. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Ida. Um, it's not a question for the BDS movement, obviously, because each one of us Palestinians in the BDS movement are involved in uh, women's unions, trade unions, farmers unions, uh, political associations, student uh, groups, and so on. So each one of us in, the, in those other capacities uh, struggle for a better future that is uh, um, more just on, on racial issues, economic issues, gender issues, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that is happening in parallel. It is not the mandate of the BDS movement to struggle to uh, change the political party here or there. Uh, it's beyond the mandate of the BDS movement. But certainly there's a lot of uh, democratic um, upheaval, if you will, especially in the last few weeks, we've seen it all over, where especially young people, youth are saying, uh, uh, we need to have not just a place at the table, it's our table. We don't want to just be invited to have our representative at the table. It's our table. We are the, the future. So we want to be a very key part of the decision making, enough ignoring us. And this is a critique for all political parties, not just one party or the other. Uh, so the, the quest for democratic rights, for women's rights, for social, economic justice, and so on, go hand in hand with the national liberation struggle. Because I've said this before and I'll repeat it, I strongly believe that nothing's come, nothing comes after liberation in, in the sense that if you don't start now working on all these issues in parallel, you can't achieve them afterwards. You will have decades and decades of 
very serious social, cultural, uh, uh, um, uh, gender issues to deal with after if you don't start now. And, and, and fortunately, most Palestinians agree with this. So the women's unions and the farmers, you know, everyone is working on, on also social economic justice issues in parallel with the national liberation struggle against apartheid and settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just going to throw in that from our experiences in so-called post-colonial nation states, right? And it's not post like colonialism is done. It just means post-independence, right? But our experiences show that again and again, that simply getting rid of the political oppression of the colonizer still leaves us with a whole host of social issues that become unresolved and an albatross on people's neck and progress. Just wanted to throw that in. And so that global history is very much connected in that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. I, I completely uh, subscribe to that, that uh, decolonization has to be really understood at a much deeper level uh, because also the colonizer is not really gone. There's informal uh, colonialism and there's, uh, you know, the formal colonialism is out, but there's informal colonialism and there's imperialism and there's uh, neoliberalism in, in bed with that. So the all kinds of challenges that need to be addressed now, not after liberation. Yeah, well, um, I live in Columbus and I um, ha own a home. And in my title, it's it it starts off as military land, and then it's this person's um, this person's um, farm that gets then subdivided into multiple private. And so we don't like that's piece of our colonial history um, that there's no record in. Um, the passage of this property that I now live on, on the on the people who lived there before it was military land and it was seized. And so I do think that there are so many ways in which um, this just, again, with that Tulsa example, um, where the history just gets papered over or forgotten or explicitly um, uh, tried to create some kind of paper trail in which it doesn't exist or something like that, so. And you know, Amy, on this point, I just wanted to comment prior to uh, Trump's ban against me entering the US, when I used to tour the US and speak at universities and churches and so on, uh, I used to insist in most places, wherever we could find, uh, what, uh, whose traditional land I was speaking on, mm. what tribe, what nation owned this land, and to recognize that before I start my speech. It's a tiny symbolic thing by one indigenous person to an indigenous nation. Uh, uh, but in, in one church in California, in the Bay Area, I can't forget exactly where, I was uh, pleasantly shocked when I went there because they, I asked the tribe there, the nation, the First Nation, for permission to speak on their traditional land. And they, they gave me the permission. And they came to bless the talk with their music and chants. It was one of the most moving things I've had in the United States. They appreciated that this indigenous Palestinian is coming and he appreciates that this is indigenous land, uh, uh, at least symbolically. I cannot do much to decolonize, but I can at least symbolically recognize that. And that also helps, this recognition also helps. Yeah, I mean, there are many other things that we could do. We could not systematically underfund our American Indian Studies program at Ohio State, for instance. <laughs> um, there are these small things that um, we could also do. Farah Chohan had a question. Um, didn't know if you wanted to ask it. Have I? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, this is my question is that, um, so I looked at the Jewish Federation website, I looked at the ADL website. So the things that we state to people, you know, such as the term apartheid, um, it, these websites basically have debunked what we're trying to say and they put out talking points for people. Um, and so my question is, does the BDS website provide talking points for us so that we can, you know, show um, that our claims are true when we speak to people, because that's been something that on their website they debunk. They say that Israel is not an apartheid state. They also try to, you know, say that Arabs are better off in Israel than other Arab countries. Um, they talk about Hamas, just all the things that we have tried to, um, you know, articulate. They're basically have talking points on their website. So where should we go to pull up talking points so we can address what they're saying as not true? 
thank you very much for this. Well, first, I, I really don't see the ADL's talking points as relevant. <laughs> I mean, it's such, an, such a far-right racist propaganda organization that is a front for the Israel lobby, why would they be a source of anything useful to discuss or to debate apartheid in Israel? I mean, really, who cares what they say? They used to spy on the anti-apartheid uh, uh, activists during the apartheid era, on, on black radical youth. They, they, the ADL has a very, very horrible history of siding with the government, with, with imperialist powers against people, against oppressed communities. So not exactly an organization that has a lot of respect. It's losing a lot more respect. Yes, at the official level, the cities still consult the ADL as if they're uh, trustworthy, but it's not an organization that has a lot of respect at the grassroots level. Thanks to the upheaval with the Black Lives Matter, people know much more about the ADL now. And of course, the ADL's position initially against Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, they, they, they lost that mask, supposedly, of a civil rights uh, organization. They really lost it. Uh, the second point is that the ADL is debating some points uh, about apartheid, ignoring that the largest human rights organization in the world, Human Rights Watch, has just issued this massive legal analysis of Israel's regime, debunk that, debunk that, they're ignoring Human Rights Watch and Israel's most prominent human rights organization, Beth Salem, is now saying it's from the river to the, to the sea. It's a Jewish from, uh, supremacist system and that is apartheid. That's Beth Salem's words, uh, debunk that. So, so all the talk about anti-Semitism and so on is to divert attention from the real issues. Uh, according to the UN definition of apartheid, it, Israel fits the bill. This is the issue. So I don't think we need to be debating uh, ADL's talking points. I think we should be propagating Human Rights Watch's uh, points and insisting on that uh, narrative, which is the Palestinian narrative all along. Palestinians for decades have been saying it's an apartheid system. Uh, and with the, in, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen the term apartheid being, you know, flooding the mainstream. It's no longer fringe. If you asked me the same question a couple of years ago, I, I might have had a different answer. M maybe, not on the ADL part. That would have been still consistent. But strategically speaking, I'm very strategic and I try to think of things strategically. But now strategically, I'm not being uh, you know, dogmatic. Strategically speaking, ignore, let them bark the ADL, who cares? Let's focus on, on, let's keep our eyes on the ball. Human Rights Watch has said this, let's, let's take this and run with it to every city council, to every state, to every corporation. Beth Salem and Human Rights Watch, and, and many Palestinians have been saying this, act against apartheid and complicity in apartheid. We don't need to, to prove anything beyond what Human Rights Watch has done. Thank you. Amira Chowry, did you have a question you wanted to, to ask? Yes, I did. Um, how should they legally go about this with the Israel being charged with crimes against humanity? How, I mean, there's like, there's an international court. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of nervous. It, okay. If they go through a legal process of formally pressing charges against the Israeli government, what are the chances of the, the government being found guilty? If we went through like a, like, let's, let's say it this way. If like, if somebody commits a crime, like, like murder or something, they go through a legal system. Why can't they do that for the Israeli government? Because one is the apartheid and it's also crimes against humanity. I mean, look at Armenia. For example, they they haven't done anything about it. Instead, they want to silence people about it. And they're trying to silence us because we know there's the evidence is clear. There's videos everywhere of kids being shot with rubber bullets, the IDF brutalizing children, adults, and everything. And there needs to be there needs to be a legal process for it. It needs to go through like through the government internationally hmm. or truth and reconciliation commission something like that 
Um, thanks, Amira, for that. The, the, unfortunately, the way the international system works, which, as we all know, was established after World War II with imperial powers, basically, <laughs> writing most of it, but mm -hmm. we still can use those tools. But no apartheid system will end in the courts. Let me put it that way. It will not end in the courts. I mean, uh, the courts have a role to play, but the, the courts also reflect the power balance at the grassroots and society and state levels. In other words, I go back to the, our basic formula as it was during the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. It's the same with our struggle against Israeli settler colonialism uh, and apartheid. We've got to build grassroots power from, from the grassroots up in order to force a change, to compel a change, uh, to, to compel the US to end complicity in Israel's uh, uh, regime of, of oppression. Uh, and then it becomes easier to dismantle mm -hmm. apartheid and settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. Now, the courts have a role to play. You mentioned the, the International Criminal Court. You're right. The International Criminal Court is currently looking into uh, uh, crimes committed in the occupied territory. That's their mandate at this point. Uh, which also includes the crime of apartheid. They have not mentioned apartheid yet, but if they're looking into crimes, but the International Criminal Court looks into individual uh, uh, suspects, not the state. They don't judge the state. They look who in Israel is responsible for building settlements, war crimes in Gaza. Uh, hopefully they investigate apartheid. Uh, uh, then they look at the individual criminals. We in the BDS movement, together with all Palestinian society have raised the slogan, investigate apartheid. We're, we're pushing every state where we have any influence to push at the United Nations General Assembly, United Nations Human Rights Council, I'll get to the council because we had some uh, progress there, to investigate Israeli apartheid. And if that UN investigative team comes out with a conclusion, as Human Rights Watch, Beth Salem, and all those Palestinian organizations, that indeed Israel is an apartheid state, then this triggers an obligation to impose lawful sanctions to end the apartheid regime. But even before then, the UN Human Rights Council just a few days ago voted for investigating all the root causes of the violent confrontations that happened recently. So they're looking at all the causes, including the system of racial discrimination in Israel. Without mentioning the A word, they will most almost certainly investigate apartheid in Israel. They cannot ignore the Human Rights Watch study uh, uh, and Beth Salem and, and others. They, will, they must look into this. So we're at a complete, we're, we're entering a new phase where the international community, despite US hegemony, despite the EU hegemony, is forced by sheer grassroots power to, to begin accepting to investigate apartheid. If Israel is found to be an apartheid state, it will help us push the case for sanctions globally in the US, the S word is not popular, but at least to cut military funding to Israel. That's the most important sanction by any other name. We don't have to use the S word. You can call it whatever. As long as you do it, that's all we care about. We're not stuck on semantics. Thank you so much. Um, Judith Polson, did you want to ask maybe the last question? Let me see if I can unmute. Yes, I have a Jewish friend who says that the Jews do have more clout in getting Israel to change, even uh, the Jews, Jews that live, Jewish people that live in America. And um, is there any way for Americans to contact members of the Knesset so that um, they can pr put some pressure on them? I mean, they might not, you might not think they have a a voice, but I know in Northern Ireland, I did um, that called talked to, emailed, wrote handwritten letters to them, uh, you know, politicians. And I told them how ashamed I was of the ones that might have be related to me. <laughs> um, but, you know, and actually it, Northern Ireland did get the agreement in 1989 that has helped a lot. But um, so anyway, yes or no? <laughs> uh, absolutely not. And I'll explain why. Um, it's a very, very different reality. 
Uh, and you, there's so many tasks that are much higher priority than appealing to member the, uh, members of the Knesset. Many of them are fascist, fascist by the textbook definition of fascist, as, is, as in they don't believe Palestinians are equal humans. That level of fascism, that's a majority in the Knesset today. We're not talking about a fringe party. We're talking about the majority do not believe that we are human enough to deserve human rights. Uh, 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 famous leaders in Israel say that those of us who are disloyal should be shot to death openly in the Knesset. So the Knesset is, is a jungle. Uh, uh, no impact whatsoever from Jewish community or anyone writing to the Knesset to change anything. Only boycotts, divestments, and eventually sanctions can have any say in this, in forcing them to change course. There is no other way. As long as their system of oppression does not cost them enough, as long as they can enjoy the largesse of the US military funding, protection of the United Nations and vetoes and preventing accountability worldwide, why would they change course? They won't recognize Palestinian rights, especially the right of Palestinian refugees. So it's, 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 we need more pressure uh, um, right to your congressperson in the United States. The Jewish community is playing an extremely important role, at least major part of it, the, the part that's more aligned with JVP, uh, if not now, and the more progressive uh, Jewish groups are already playing a major role. They're saying what Israel is perpetrating against Palestinians, it cannot be in our names. It's not in our names. Israel does not speak for us. That's a very important uh, uh, change that's happening. Uh, uh, surveys of Jewish American opinion, one survey after another, most of them done by the lobby, J Street and, and others, are showing a, a fast growing minority reaching almost a majority among younger Jewish Americans that are supportive of boycotts against Israel, not just pressure, boycotts against Israel. BDS is growing tremendously among youth, Jewish youth in the United States. Israel recognizes that to the extent that, I don't know if people followed, the former Israeli, ambas uh, Israeli ambassador to Washington, uh, uh, Dermer, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago said, we cannot rely on those liberal Jews in the US. You know, they're too liberal. Israel doesn't matter much to them. They're not devoted to Israel as they used to be. It's the evangelical Christian Zionists that we can rely on because it's an article of faith to them to oh. support Israel no matter what it does. This is a former ambassador to the to our Israeli ambassador to Washington, mainstream, saying, you know, forget about American Jews, they're, they're, they're useless. They're too liberal. They're too liberal. And they're getting caught up in this intersectionality and Black Lives Matter and whatnot. So, uh, wow. and, and they're talking about Palestinian rights all of a sudden, whatever happened to them? Well, uh, this, this uh, uh, Zionist assumption that there's one monolithic Jewish uh, group and everyone speaks the same, which is a very anti-Semitic premise, has been shattered. Okay. And JVP played a key role in shattering that. Yeah. Pranav, did you want to jump in on this? And then I might just close with Tamara Erickson as a last question. Sure. Just we've covered so many topics, and and again, thanks for for all of this. Um, I think one that we might want to uh, address a little bit is just that question of, um, you know, the question of what's changed with Biden and the Biden era. Um, the way I like to think about it is, when Biden sends, you know, all of this money and support to Israel, he's not betraying anyone because he said in his platform very clearly that he was a, a supporter of Israel. Um, so it's not really a betrayal. It's, um, you know, the Democratic president doing what they do. Um, and at the same time, there seems to be an opening. And I think there's many people who probably voted for Biden who are also out in the streets for Palestine right now, you know. Um, so, so just thinking about in this moment, what do we do to both accurately say what Biden is doing um, as part of a long history um, of, of liberal imperialism, right? And at the same time, talk to people who did vote for the lesser evil and bring them into the, into the, into the movement. Yeah, thanks for that. Biden is the lesser evil domestically. Right, right. For, for Palestinians, I mean, everyone is citizen. I meant like quote. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the U US empire, because I was once, told by progressive Americans, 
yeah, Palestinians don't have much to say about US elections because you know it's for up to US citizens. I said, well, you got that wrong. There's one empire and we're all subjects of the empire. We're not citizens, but we're all subjects of empire. So everyone has a say about the US because the US has a say in every oppression on earth, especially ours. So Palestinians must have a say about the US. So Biden is the lesser evil in the US to Palestinians. We're not seeing the lesser part, not yet. I mean, we're not seeing the lesser part. It's just evil, pure and simple. That doesn't mean that we don't see the potential. I mean, again, we're not dogmatic. We understand in the Democratic Party, things have changed. You look at the base of the Democratic Party, much more black, much more Latino, much more women, much, you know, it's just changed. The demographics have changed. Uh, many more progressives and, and so on and so forth. It's not the same base. And this is reflecting in some members of Congress that are asking for accountability. Now they're talking about apartheid and AOC is saying apartheid is no democracy. And, and Cory Bush is saying it's time for sanctions. We, I mean, words that would have been sacrilegious just months ago are today you know, uttered in Congress. Uh, so things are changing even for Biden, but we need much, much more of that pressure to force him to change. Yes, a, li a liberal emperor is still an emperor. Right. And to the rest of the world, they don't see the liberal part. They see the emperor part. The same US military bases and the same investments in Israel and $735 million extra in precision bombs to kill Palestinians with precision. Okay. <laughs> we don't see the liberal in, in the liberal uh, uh, emperor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we take a lot, we, 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 we're, we're really hopeful with what's happening across the US, not just in Hollywood and the music industry and the academics and the students and the churches. Look at what they're doing in, 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 in Oakland, California, the Block the Boat Initiative. They're trying to block an Israeli boat from docking in Oakland, as they've done in 2014. And look at so many statements, whether Harvard, Columbia, or Princeton, elsewhere, calling for academic boycotts. Mm -hmm. the academic boycott suddenly is not is becoming an okay term to use. It's a proper term to use. You don't ruin the party if you mention it among academics, they accept it. It's, things are changing and that gives us a lot of hope. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Maybe one more question, um, Tamara Erickson. Thank you. Thank you, Omar, for taking the time to speak with us. I appreciate it. Uh, so as a Jew growing up in America, I did not learn about the Nakba in Sunday school. Um, and I feel like a lot of my friends and other Jews that I know, you know, learned about what's really going on there, you know, via study abroad programs in Israel. And, you know, with, you know, the BDS movement and, you know, a lot of, you know, universities, you know, are no longer you know, allowing their students to study abroad in Israel. And I guess my concern is that, you know, it limits, you know, Jews being exposed to what's really going on there um, and being able to see it for themselves. And I'm wondering what you thought about that. Okay, but whites did not have to go to South Africa to really get apartheid. Uh, the absolute majority of white people did not visit South Africa, but they still realize it's apartheid and they took action against it. Um, I think most Jewish Americans don't need to set foot there, especially on a Zionist program that is meant to brainwash them, like uh, Birthright and those other uh, Zionist programs, uh, because even if they learn something there, the harm is uh, far outweighs the benefit. Uh, in other words, by going on those trips paid for by the Israeli government and the, and the Israel lobby and Zionist uh, movements and, and so on, people are already hurt the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. Uh, I think attending a JPP seminar, reading an If Not Now brochure, uh, going to lectures here and there, you can learn a lot more about the history, about the Nakba, about uh, Jewish history, Palestinian history, and, and so on, without being complicit in a way. Uh, because birthright programs are complicit programs, obviously. And Israel uses them to say, yeah, we, we speak for all Jews and all Jewish youth come to Israel, to their country. Uh, um, so they use that against us, against all the solidarity movement. It hurts us. There, there are many more ethical ways of learning about uh, settler colonialism, oppression, and apartheid without being complicit in it. 
Thanks, Tamara, for that question. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Omar. For, I know it's late for you, um, so I'm so grateful um, for your time. Um, and I wanted to kind of wrap us up and also um, thank everybody who was who was who was here with us sharing this moment. Um, Pranav, thank you, my co-moderator. It's so helpful to have somebody else here to um, to think through um, these questions. And, and thank you for all your work, Amy. <laughs> I, I wanted to um, to just let you guys know we are um, encouraging people to take um, immediate action uh, even today. So um, so if you could um, uh, consider, for instance, giving to this uh, this organization, Palestine um, Medical Aid, that would be great. And then also I wanted to let you know um, of our next uh, conversation with uh, the writers of We Are Not Numbers uh, coming to us from. Uh, Gaza and a few who are now living abroad and that will be in July and we will let all of you know the time and the specific date uh, of that by email. So if you have registered for this event, we will send you our um, recording of this event and please do share it with everyone uh, that you know and then we'll also give you the information on how to register for this next event. But uh, for now, I just wanna thank, thank all of you so much. Um, and I wanna thank my local organizer, Michael Liebert is getting us connected to everyone um, and uh, Connie Hammond, who manages our technology. <laughs> this, this event literally wouldn't have a physical space or a virtual space without her. Um, Farrell Brody really keeps us focused on uh, the really important stuff. Uh, Bonnie Awan keeps us um, uh, laughing really when it when it's really hard to laugh. She keeps it light and that is really very helpful. So, um, so thank you all so much uh, locally, you feed me. And thank you, Omar, for giving your time yeah. at this at this very late hour. And our ASL interpreters, thank you so much for helping us share this event even more widely. Take care. Yeah.